Olive Thomas's passing is notable for being the first true scandal of Hollywood. Her story unfolded like a dark fable from the glamorous yet secretive corridors of early Hollywood. The headlines that announced her death, Olive Thomas dead from poison, sent ripples through the film industry. It turned the sophisticated Hotel Crillon in Paris into the scene of a grim narrative. Now imagine the scene. The valet is routine morning service turned to horror. The royal suite, a place of luxury, now a tableau of tragedy. And there, amidst the opulence, lay Olive Thomas. Her once vibrant form, now still, draped across a sable opera cape. The story of Olive Thomas is shrouded in a dark, almost gothic aura. Today, she's not well remembered, but back in 1920, she was on the cusp of major stardom. Tragically, her life was cut short before her 26th birthday, under circumstances that were as shocking as they were mysterious. At the time, her career was gaining momentum with the release of her penultimate film, The Flapper. And alongside her husband, Jack Pickford, Olive had set off to Paris for a long-awaited honeymoon. But their celebration turned to tragedy when Olive, after a night out, consumed a deadly mixture of mercury bichloride and alcohol. This toxic concoction, intended for external use to treat Jack syphilis, became the agent of her doom. Following the revelation of Jack's illness, the public began to might have ruled it accidental. But that didn't stop people from guessing. The massive turnout at her funeral was reminiscent of the scenes at Valentino's later on, with some fans fainting in grief. This was what the papers reported, at least. But the reality of her death was more disturbing than any Hollywood or yellow journalism fiction. The exposure of Jack syphilis, Olive's horrific reaction to the poison, and her prolonged painful death in a grim Parisian hospital painted a bleak picture. Jack, affected by her passing and the ordeal of witnessing her decline, overwhelmed him. As a somber postscript, Olive's final resting place in the Bronx stands in stark contrast to the sunny Californian graves of her family. Her tome, marked simply with Pickford, hides the fact that it houses the remains of a once radiant young actress, while the other Pickfords rest under individual stones in a revered family plot. The narrative surrounding Olive now is one of a mourning for a young life lost too soon. It's become a haunting, yet romantic story. So how did it all begin? How did she become Hollywood's first major scandal? Oliveretta Lane Duffy, known to the world as Olive Thomas, was born in Charleroi, Pennsylvania on October 20th, 1894. Her birth certificate reads Oliva R. Duffy, the R representing her mother Raina's name. Throughout most of her life, she went by Olive, and her family and close friends called her Ollie. Her life took a hard turn in 1906 with the sudden loss of her father, James Duffy, a worker in the structural steel industry. In the aftermath, Olive and her brothers, James and William, moved to McKees Rocks, a suburb of Pittsburgh, to live with their grandparents. This arrangement was necessary as their mother, Raina, worked extensive hours in a factory to support the family. Raina's life saw some relief when she married Harry M. Van Kirk from the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad. They had a daughter named Harriet, whom Ollie loved. Although Harriet passed away in a car accident at the age of 17. Life wasn't easy for Olive and her siblings following their father's death. It's around this time that she began to work as a nude model. Some have suggested her brothers coerced her into taking this kind of work. But the figures don't exactly add up. Olive was the eldest child, and her brother is only 12 and 9 at the time. 
Most likely, she might have taken the decision herself. The prospect of new clothes was a major draw, but her generally thoughtful personality meant that any other money she earned went to helping her struggling family. Olive left school at 15 to work at Horn's department store in Pittsburgh. By June 1919, as per a motion picture magazine article, she had worked her way up to a sales girl position. She was proud of being the youngest sales lady at Horn's. Olive always held a fond memory of these early working days, particularly admiring Miss Milligan, the head of Gingham's, who she aspired to emulate. However, the monotonous life and industrial smog of Pennsylvania were in stark contrast to New York City, the place Olive dreamed of conquering. She often compared herself to the glamorous Seigfeld girls, envisioning her own face replacing theirs on the chocolate boxes in a drugstore window. This wasn't just a daydream. Olive had the looks to match, and she knew it. By 1911, Olive had married Bernard Krug Thomas, who worked as a clerk at a local train car manufacturer. Though according to other reports, he worked in a steel mill. Olive, only 16 at the time for marriage, soon realized it was a mistake. This realization encouraged her to leave Pittsburgh for the big opportunities of New York City. Once Olive arrived in New York, she found shelter with a relative in Harlem. There, she roamed the streets of Uptown, searching for work, and soon landed a job at the basement counter of a department store. This was a step up from her life in Pittsburgh. Despite still selling gingham, she was inching closer to her ambition of making a name for herself. It was this dream that fueled her determination. Olive's natural, doll-like beauty boosted her chances of realizing this dream. Her impromptu decision to take part in a contest titled The Most Beautiful Girl in New York City was the start of an incredible journey from obscurity to stardom. A local newspaper wanting to attract shop girl readers announced a competition organized by commercial artist Howard Chandler Christie. He was looking for the perfect model, the epitome of New York beauty. The contest promised prizes and the opportunity to have one's picture featured in the newspaper. Freed from the gloom of Pittsburgh, Olive's Irish beauty was ready to shine. She called in sick at work dressed in her modest best, and headed downtown to Christie's studio, joining a crowd of hopeful girls. It was a gathering of charming beauties, representing every facet of New York's melting pot. Olive stood out among them and triumphed. The victory brought her the prize, her picture in the paper, and the publicity she needed. So there she was, the most beautiful girl in New York City, the famous artist Harrison Fisher went a step further, declaring Olive as the most beautiful girl in the world. This wasn't flattery, it was a sentiment shared by plenty of artists and photographers of the time. Olive's stunning looks made her a popular model. She soon found herself posing for well-known artists like Penner and Sandlaws, William Haskell Coffin, and Alberto Vargas, earning 50 cents an hour which is roughly $6 today. Her next step was a big one. She found herself in the office of Florence Seigfeld Jr. He was the man behind the Seigfeld Follies, a theatrical review based on the legendary Folie Bergère of Paris. The Broadway equivalent began in 1907 and was a smash hit. This was, in the pre-Hollywood era, the surest road to stardom that America had to offer. In 1911, Seigfeld rebranded his Follies show as the Seigfeld Follies. A few years later, he introduced the Seigfeld Midnight Frolic, a review that doubled as a training ground for the Follies. This show, beginning at midnight, featured dance music interspersed between acts. The first Seigfeld 9 o'clock Frolic, later renamed the Seigfeld 9 o'clock Review, launched in 1918. Unfortunately, Prohibition, starting in 1922, dampened the success of these frolics, which relied on vast consumption of alcohol alongside the entertainment. 
As a Seifeld girl, Olive became an instant Broadway sensation. Florence Seifeld Jr. was in the business of glorifying the American girl. His shows were a celebration of feminine beauty, especially when said beauty belonged to a celebrity. Olive personified youth and beauty. She was living now with a newfound fame from newspaper features, and she captured the hearts of many well-to-do society men, receiving adoration, lavish gifts, and other treasures. Among the opulent presents were diamond necklaces, pendants, rings, and orchids. There were even rumors that the German ambassador, Bernstorff, gifted Olive a $10,000 string of pearls, a sum equating to around $100,000 today. With her mix of beauty, charm, and wit, Olive Thomas drew men in like a siren. Philip Mendel, who was a dramatic editor of the New York Tribune, said, to know Olive Thomas personally is like being on friendly terms with an angel. Sunday supplement editors would fight for the chance to take pictures of her for their papers because she was so beautiful. She had become a sensation. As a Ziegfeld girl and Ziegfeld's mistress, Olive gained enough confidence to end her marriage with her small town husband on February 25th, 1915. The marriage which had lasted four years ended on the grounds of cruelty and neglect. The only thing she retained from this brief and unhappy union was her married name, Thomas. And although she rarely revisited her Pittsburgh roots, Olive remained devoted to her family. She regularly sent substantial checks and luxurious gifts, like silk stockings, to her mother. Earning $75 per week as a Ziegfeld showgirl, a hefty sum equivalent to about $1,400 today, Olive had come a long way from her days as a shop girl, making $3 a week. Despite her modest beginnings, she was never hesitant to spend on those she loved, often to the point of overextending her finances. This generosity of hers was well known, but it frequently resulted in her bank account being overdrawn. By 1916, Olive's talents had evolved to the point where she performed a solo in one of the frolic scenes. Her voice impressed Seigfeld so much that he was ready to offer her a regular, major role in his shows. However, before he could propose this, Thomas Ince enticed her away to Hollywood. This development was the start of a challenging period for Seigfeld. He was flattered that his girls were being selected for the burgeoning film industry, but he soon recognized Hollywood as a formidable rival. He launched a campaign with ads emphasizing Ziegfeld Follies, glorifying the American girl in the flesh, not canned. The frolic shows were as dazzling as the Follies reviews, but with a twist. The performers wore less, some even appearing nude, and audience interaction was encouraged. These shows featured the most attractive and charming girls, performing for some of the wealthiest men in the world, with a few lucky ones marrying into this elite circle. Seigfeld enhanced his shows, making them increasingly grand and extravagant. His flair for opulent sets and productions became legendary. In one instance, he paid an actress $600, about $5,000 today, just to wear a gown worth $1,200, roughly $10,000 today, for a brief walk across the stage. Another time, he spent twenty-five dollars equivalent to $250,000 today, on a set, only to discard it for being too flamboyant. Each production outdid the previous one in cost and ambition, leaving Ziegfeld perpetually balancing between financial success and ruin. Though the Ziegfeld follies and frolics continued for a time, Olive was not the only star to depart for Hollywood. Ziegfeld eventually lost many of his most celebrated beauties to the film industry, including Billy Dove, Paulette Goddard, Irene Doon, Mae Murray, Marion Davies, Barbara Stanwyck, and Hedy Lamarr. Ironically, Hollywood turned several women, who Seigfeld had rejected for not meeting his showgirl standard, into movie stars. Norma Shearer and Alice Faye were once dismissed from Seigfeld auditions, but later found success in the very industry he competed with. 
Seifeld Jr. was known for his romantic entanglements with several of his Follies girls, and Olive Thomas was one of them. Seifeld's wife, Billy Burke, acknowledged in her autobiography that Olive was one of the only Follies that he truly cared about. This makes Seifeld's apparent resentment towards Olive's passionate romance with Jack Pickford, the actor brother of the famous Mary Pickford, even more understandable. Seifeld's loss was twofold. He lost Olive not only as a mistress, but also as a star showgirl to the burgeoning film industry that Jack was a part of. Olive first met Jack Pickford at a dance in a beach cafe, as she later recalled in the 1919 Motion Picture Magazine interview. She fondly remembered, Jack is a beautiful dancer. He danced his way into my heart. We knew each other for eight months before our marriage and most of that time we gave to dancing. We got along so well on the dance floor that we just naturally decided that we would be able to get along together for the remainder of our lives. Their romance progressed quickly, and on their third date, Jack presented Olive with a lavish gift, a $12,000 platinum cigarette case, worth about $125,000 today, inscribed with to Olive Thomas, the only sweetheart I will ever have. Despite Jack's notorious image as a hard-drinking, drug-using womanizer, their relationship seemed to be rooted in genuine affection. Rumors circulated that they were secretly married in New Jersey on October 25, 1916, with actor Thomas Megan reportedly the witness. However, the absence of a marriage license has led to lingering questions about the legality of their union. Were Jack and Olive truly legally married? The answer remains a mystery. And as for Siegfeld, well, in his final years, Siegfeld Jr.'s behavior became increasingly erratic. Facing financial turmoil, he neglected letters and bills, letting them pile up unattended for months. To avoid creditors who frequently waited at the theater's main entrance, he resorted to using the fire escape for exits and entries. Haunted by time and death, he banned all clocks and watches from his vicinity, as their ticking was a grim reminder of mortality. In a desperate bid to defy aging, Zeigfeld turned to hormone pills, believed to rejuvenate virility. He would test their effects in his office with willing chorus girls, and during the weekend, when his wife, Billy Burke, was away in Hollywood, he would host wild parties at home. It was a pitiable chapter in the life of a man who, terrified of death, went to extremes to assert his vitality. Ultimately, in 1931, Seifeld had to face the one event he couldn't avoid, his own funeral, the first and last he would ever attend. Olive's rise to fame in the Follies and Frolics naturally paved her way to a film career. Her screen debut came with the Beatrice Fairfax film series in 1916, produced by Wharton Studios in Ithaca, New York. She's shown in the role of Rita Malone in the 10th episode titled Play Ball. Olive's stage experience was invaluable, but she was the first to admit that film acting was a whole new ball game. Her contribution to early cinema might well be remembered for setting an impressive record. Within just 24 days, she completed two five-reel comedy dramas, a feat driven by her plans to visit Pittsburgh and New York. Her work on Heiress for a Day in 1918 was particularly intense. Olive dedicated herself to the project, often working non-stop day and night. Meals were consumed in her dressing room where she and the director would use even these brief breaks to discuss scenes and plot points. Olive was aware of the unpredictability of the film industry and was determined to be more than a pretty face on screen. She was eager to learn every aspect of filmmaking, observing and asking questions to deepen her knowledge of it. Her first starring role came with the release of Madcap Madge on June 24, 1917, where she played the character Betty this was one of six films Olive featured in that year alone, a busy and productive period in her career. 
Thomas's career in film escalated rapidly. She signed with Triangle Pictures and then moved to Hollywood. Later, producer David O. Selznick founded Selznick Pictures and built it around Olive. He signed her for eight films annually, and by 1920, Olive had starred in a total of 19 films. Her last movie, The Flapper, gained widespread attention, partly due to the circumstances of her untimely death. The film captured the essence of the flappers, young women who defied traditional norms in both behavior and fashion. Olive represented a transition from the demure heroines, like those portrayed by her sister-in-law, Mary Pickford, to the bolder, more provocative flappers of the 1920s, epitomized by stars like Clara Bow. Despite their rebellious exterior, flappers were often depicted as having hearts of gold, a trait Olive embodied with her continued support and generosity towards her family, even after finding fame. Following Olive's tragic, poisoning death, suspicion naturally fell on Jack Pickford, who was with her at the time. The varying accounts of the incident, including conflicting stories about what she consumed and why, only fueled these suspicions. Reports also conflicted on whether Olive was able to speak during her final days, with some claiming she called out for Pickford. Adding to the controversy, the New York Times reported that Olive had taken out a substantial life insurance policy just weeks before her death, further complicating Pickford's situation. The marriage between Thomas and Pickford was known for its intensity and volatility, yet it was underpinned by love. Amidst the tragedy of Thomas's death, there were those who suspected Pickford of foul play. Florence Seigfeld even suggested that Pickford was responsible for breaking Thomas's heart. Mary Pickford, Jack's sister, reportedly influenced how the press covered the incident, swaying it somewhat in her brother's favor. Despite all the rumors and speculation, the doctor who attended to Thomas ultimately ruled her death an accident. Jack Pickford was more than just a sibling of the famed Mary Pickford. He had a moderately successful film career in his own right. And when he and Thomas tied the knot in 1918, she chose to retain her first husband's surname, eager to make her mark without relying on the Pickford name. Jack had a reputation as a womanizer, a trait he seemingly continued even after marrying Olive. Olive's murky death wasn't Jack's first brush with controversy. In 1918, during his stint in the Navy, he became entangled in a dubious scheme designed to help men evade military service. This led to a court-martial and an initial dishonorable discharge. However, after becoming a state witness in the subsequent trial related to the case, his discharge was reclassified on medical grounds. Jack's career in the film industry continued until about 1928, around the time when talkies started to dominate the scene. His personal life saw him marrying twice more, both times to Zeigfeld performers, but neither of these marriages endured. Perhaps he never overcame the loss of his beautiful young bride, Olive Thomas. Our cultural fascination with youthful beauty, tragically cut short, is deep-rooted and enduring. This intrigue recalls the ancient motif of death in the maiden where death becomes her first and last suitor. It also coincides with 19th century ballads about young women lost too soon. Being a fan of a star who died young means you avoid witnessing their potential decline into a difficult later life. Like Mary Pickford's quiet, aged years marred by alcoholism, David O'Selznick's description of Olive as a dancing sunbeam suddenly snuffed out like a candle captures the sentiment perfectly. Mourning a young movie star from the past, like Olive, feels familiar, yet there's a lingering sense of not truly knowing her. A private memorial service for Olive away from the over-the-top plans being discussed in New York was organized by Will Rogers in Hollywood. Though throughout his life, Lawrence Seigfeld's intense fear of death kept him away from funerals despite losing many friends and colleagues. He managed and largely financed Olive's funeral arrangements, 
He was known for sending extravagant floral tributes to industry peers who passed away. But he couldn't bring himself to attend. In retrospect, it was fortunate for Jack Pickford that Ziegfeld was absent, considering Ziegfeld held him responsible for Olive's death and had vowed to beat Jack up if they ever crossed paths again. The Olive Thomas collection, comprising a documentary and her film, The Flapper, comes close to delivering this emotional experience, complete with a little morbid fascination. Despite her challenges, Olive Thomas is celebrated in this documentary as a lively, intelligent woman who embraced life and pursued success with determination. The narrative is mostly upbeat, briskly covering her impoverished youth in Pennsylvania, her early marriage at 16, and subsequent divorce at 20, and her rapid rise in New York from a shop girl to a Condé Nast model, then a headliner in the Seichfeld Follies. The story then follows her journey to Hollywood, where she transitioned from a hard-working bit player to an emerging movie star before reaching its tragic conclusion. Amidst the whirl of her career, Olive's tumultuous romance and marriage to Jack Pickford played out complete with conflicts involving the Pickford family. Mary and her mother, concerned, wished that Jack would abandon his reckless lifestyle and focus on his career. Olive, full of life, tended to match Jack's own wildness, leading to a roller coaster relationship filled with intense arguments, reconciliations, extravagant lifestyles, and heavy drinking. Olive demonstrated a strong will. She was deeply in love with Jack and had a clear vision for her future. Amidst all the chaos, they managed to fulfill contracts, make movies, and earn a substantial income. There were more challenging aspects to Olive's character. She struggled with alcohol, had a tempestuous sexual life that she sometimes leveraged to her advantage, and was known for her fiery temperament and uninhibited speech. At times, Olive's language was shockingly unfiltered. One example involves Lenore Coffey's memories of Olive. Coffey recounted an incident which highlighted Olive's surprising lack of self-awareness. Olive was in a hotel lobby where an elderly woman admired her lavish diamond ring. Olive's response was disarmingly blunt and somewhat shocking, telling the woman in an offhand manner, it's easy, honey. I got this for two humps with a Jew in Palm Beach. This story, possibly refined by Lenore Coffey over time and complete with a punchline, shows the candid side of Olive. But over time, the story has been diluted. The documentary filmmaker is likely chose to admit it due to its hint of anti-Semitism, a sentiment not uncommon in that era. However, what stands out is not Olive's views on Jewish people, but her unfiltered way of expressing herself. Unlike the Gish sisters, who had a watertight public persona, Olive was given to controversial statements like this. Curiously, this story did surface in one of the two brief skits included in Milestone CVD. Albeit with a twist, the word Jew is replaced with gentleman. The alteration subtly changes the tone, making Olive's forthright manner seem more playful than outright provocative. The documentary's exclusion of this anecdote eludes its exploration of Olive's complex character. The filmmaker's focus on her assertive personality, her unabashed sexuality, and her party lifestyle as components of a new archetype of female stardom, distinct from the likes of Lillian Gish. Aside from this willingness to provoke, Olive was not always a model of professionalism. While screen testing Olive for a film, Billy Bitzer, D.W. Griffith's top cameraman, was taken aback by her seemingly casual approach. She had beauty, he remarked, but she was a new type. I was skeptical. She showed a lack of seriousness. Some have called this lackadaisical approach a strategic move by Olive telling Bitzer in the industry that she was charting her own path. However, the full context of Bitzer's experience with Olive reveals more. It includes a detour to a bar where Olive, 
en route to select costumes for a screen test convinced him to join her for a drink. He exhibited gentlemanly manners and agreed to just one drink. But when Olive and a friend decided to have another, and Bitzer objected, insisting she choose between the drink and the film role, the situation escalated. The friend labeled Bitzer a big slob for trying to control Olive, who herself retorted with, go soak your head. This incident seems more like off-the-cuff defiance than a calculated career tactic. Bitzer found Olive's demeanor jarring. He was accustomed to the submissive professionalism that Griffith elicited from his young actresses. The Gish sisters and Mae Marsh viewed Griffith almost as a paternal figure. They always showed immense gratitude and loyalty to him, a stark contrast to Olive's independent streak. Bitzer's observation underscores a key point. Olive Thomas was determined to break free from the mold Bitzer and others represented. She was forging her own path in the film industry, relying on her own instincts and self-assurance. This sense of self is the essence of Olive's story. Her unwavering self-belief seems to have been her defining trait. Olive Thomas was an infusion of beauty and intelligence, and she seemed to approach industry professionals like producers, directors, and even Billy Bitzer with tactical finesse. She looked at them as men she could maneuver to her advantage. This approach wasn't novel, but it was somewhat fresh in the early years of the movie industry post-World War I. By then, the only female movie star with significant executive influence was Mary Pickford. And Olive's brand of power was more like a hard-won autonomy of prominent stage actresses, some Broadway stars and even high-end prostitutes from the early 20th century. Having honed her skills in this environment, Olive stepped into the film world with a serious presence. Even in her teenage years, Olive had charmed New York as a Condé Nast model and a Ziegfeld girl. She managed to capture the affection of Flo Ziegfeld, turning into his lover and stirring the air of his wife, Billy Burke. She got what she wanted, and when the time was right, she left it all behind. The Follies, Ziegfeld, New York, all to pursue a career in Hollywood. As a mistress, Olive likely posed a complex challenge for many influential men. Jack Pickford might have been her one true love, and ironically her downfall, but in her final years, she also had a profound impact on the Selznick brothers. She's rumored to have had an affair with Myron and to have caused a deep infatuation in the younger David. Some reports from the time suggested that David's adoption of the middle initial O was a tribute to Olive. As Olive's fame and marketability grew, her personal life was increasingly shrouded in mystery or completely reinvented for public consumption. Movie magazines portrayed her as a witty, charmingly sweet-natured, and somewhat reserved. She was depicted as the ideal girl next door, the kind you'd love to meet and join in a game of bobbing for apples, a genuine sweetheart. However, these contrived interviews and idealized articles couldn't mask the depth and complexity evident in her eyes. Eyes which were arguably her most captivating feature. Her eyes, described as light blue or gray, seemed to dominate her face in some photographs. But what stood out even more was a senpaku in her eyes, the visible white space between the iris and the lower eyelid. This trait, highly unusual when someone looks directly at you, has historically been interpreted in various ways, from being a symbol of the evil eye to being caused by nutritional deficiencies. In Olive's case, it neither suggested malnutrition nor malevolence. On screen, this unique feature of her eyes made her face stand out dramatically, like a beacon illuminating the frame and capturing the audience's attention. Even in long shots, the direction of her gaze was clear and compelling. Among a crowd of other actresses, Olive was easily identifiable. In close-ups, her gaze was magnetic, portraying the depth of an exceptional character, of allure and complexity. As you immerse yourself in Olive Thomas's gaze, you can begin to feel a connection with this young woman. 
but primary source information on her life and character are mysteriously rare. A former Seifeld dancer spoke about all of it, the follies, but her tenor began after Olive's departure. Family members, like a grandniece and a cousin, have shared old family tales. Yet, everyday snapshots of Olive, away from her celebrity life, are almost unknown. Her legacy is primarily preserved through her films, production photos, and formal portraits. Regrettably, only about half of her films are believed to still exist. And many of those are tucked away in private collections potentially deteriorating. The Flapper is the sole film readily available for home viewing. In the 1917 silent film, An Even Break, which survives only in fragments, Olive is captured in a scene driving a car, pursued by villains with guns and racing against a locomotive. These are typical thrills of silent films from that era. Thomas, with her signature long curls flowing freely, shows off an adventurous spirit as she maneuvers a sporty auto. This was a thrilling vision of womankind at this time, driving a car at high speed on the run from gun-toting bad guys. The technological future had arrived, and for once, it seemed, women were invited to participate. Films from this early period when the language of cinema was still being crafted and techniques were basic can often feel like well put together home movies. The goal in this scene was simple, put Olive in a car, let her drive, and capture it on film. The outcome, years later, gives us a glimpse into Olive's world. She appears young, perhaps not overly experienced with racing cars on rural roads, but her expression is one of eagerness and sheer enjoyment. You can feel her own real exhilaration in these scenes and the sense of actual danger is palpable. The documentary simplifies Olive's work by suggesting she was merely playing herself. But there is something to the notion of Olive naturally stepping into her roles, reacting more than acting, as John Wayne once distinguished in discussing movie acting. The emotions and expressions we see seem authentically Olive's, this natural projection and amplification of personality is what transforms an individual into a movie star in the modern sense. Olive Thomas was a forerunner in this regard. As the film industry was just beginning to see the rise of such charismatic stars, her early work makes it evident that Olive possessed a commanding presence and the ability to project this larger-than-life personality right from the start. The flapper is filled with moments that display all of Thomas's charm, making it easy to overlook the film itself. It's a light-hearted comedy, decently produced but not particularly memorable, except for Olive's portrayal of a character nearly a decade younger than herself. She appears as a beautiful woman, oddly out of place in a teenage sailor suit. By 1920, Olive's prospects in the film industry looked promising, Selznick's promotional efforts for The Flapper, and her final film, Everybody's Sweetheart, reinforced the image Olive had crafted. She was seen as a brave, clever, and naturally attractive young woman. And in the years surrounding World War I, the fascination with youth was as prevalent as it is today. Films from the teens into the 20s frequently featured youthful heroines. They were innocent, yet spirited, and often found themselves in and out of perilous situations due to their naive approach to the world's dangers. This archetype, originating in 19th century stage melodramas, found new life in American cinema. An example is D.W. Griffith's 1911 short, The Lonsdale Operator, starring Blanche Sweet, where Griffith's leading women often played teenage characters. Olive's sister-in-law, Mary Pickford, built her career and fortune on portraying young girls, even pre-teens, well into her 30s. At the time of Olive Thomas's death, she seemed set to continue portraying youthful characters for a while. Yet watching her in The Flapper, it's debatable how much longer she could have maintained sex roles. Unlike Mary Pickford, who transitioned seamlessly into adult parts while retaining her ingenue charm, Olive's more mature and knowing expressions coupled with an obvious sensuality at 25 
made her less convincing as a sexually inexperienced girl, regardless of the size of the bow in her hair, all of which ties again into her expressive gaze. However, she nonetheless convincingly plays a 16-year-old in the film, and it might be the contrast between her mature allure and the innocence of the character that makes her so interesting. The flapper thematically touches on a teenager's eagerness to grow up. Olive's character, Genevieve King, is a precursor to characters like Gidget, rebelling against the strict norms of her overly conservative hometown of Warring Springs, Florida. Produced around the start of Prohibition in 1919, Warring Springs is portrayed as so prim that it doesn't even have a saloon to close. After being caught with a boy, Genevieve is sent to a northern boarding school by her father, a senator and presumably a widower. Genevieve quickly finds herself in a predicament. While playing in the snow with other girls, she catches the eye of Richard Channing, an older man who is the object of affection for many of the girls. Richard's daily horse rides near the school's playground raises no alarms, and the girls continue to fantasize about him. As Genevieve, now nicknamed Ginger, plots to meet Richard, her boyfriend from Orange Springs shows up from a nearby military academy. Their unauthorized date, a daylight sleigh ride, turns comical when she is unceremoniously dumped in the snow, leading to her rescue by Richard. Ginger asks, did you notice a gentleman driving away in a sleigh? Richard replies, no, but I saw a kid chasing one. Ginger's imagined adventure kicks off when Richard invites her to a dance, clearly attracted to the young girl. Thomas's portrayal is so authentic that it might prompt modern audiences to question Richard's intentions. However, the flapper ensures that nothing inappropriate happens to Ginger. Richard emerges as a guardian rather than a seducer, handling his attraction while maintaining a protective stance. The Flapper stands out as an effectively paced and entertaining film, thanks to all of Thomas's performance. Watching her bring the character of Ginger King to life is a delight, as she portrays someone absorbed in her own eccentric world, a trait common among the best comedians. And there are moments of darkness too, when Ginger's dramatic appearance at a dance leads to chaos. She half-heartedly tries to hang herself from a light fixture, this is a shocking precursor to the events that brought her own life to an end. In one scene, Ginger witnesses another girl sneaking out with a man, just as the school's safe is discovered empty. Amid the ensuing commotion, Ginger, still in her pajamas, tries to appear shocked but can't hide her excitement. She comically moves from room to room with her makeshift noose still around her neck, dragging the cord behind her. When the other girls finally notice, Ginger quickly styles the noose into a fashion accessory and confidently walks upstairs. Ginger's escape to New York City is shown in a charming scene where Thomas rides atop a double-decker bus, giving viewers a real look at 1920 New York. Her exaggerated reactions to the city sights, including warding off an overly friendly older man, add to the comedy of this scene. In New York, Ginger gets the chance to dress and act like a flapper, a woman devoted to pleasure-seeking. One memorable scene has her smoking in a palm-potted restaurant. Olive's portrayal of a flapper differs from the stereotypical image of the later 1920s, representing a more traditional, womanly figure, rather than the androgynous style that would later become popular. When Ginger returns to Orange Springs in flamboyant flapper attire, complete with a long ornamental walking stick, her outfit is more dignified than carefree. Olive brings a playful air to her final scene with Channing, where she insinuates a double life. This insinuation is left to the audience to decode. The story wraps up with Ginger back in her simple gingham dress. This is the end of her escapades. The film concludes with a flurry of comedic resolutions that tidy up the plot so efficiently the audience scarcely has time to question any of its many wild implausibilities. The flapper may not have broken any molds, but it's an early example of Hollywood's rapidly developing knack for engaging storytelling. 
The flapper feels very different in the context of all of Thomas's tragic life story. Speculating on what she might have achieved had she lived longer is interesting, but uncertain. Olive was interested in filmmaking itself. It's conceivable that she aspired to take creative control of her films. Much like Chaplin, Keaton, or her sister-in-law, Mary Pickford. Especially during the pioneering days before the film industry was dominated by moguls. Whether she would have had the chance to ascend to such heights remains a question, particularly as the industry was already closing down such independent avenues, even at the time of her death. Even figures like Chaplin and Pickford saw their influence wane over time. Nonetheless, The Flapper shows Thomas's potential as a great comedian and teases us with the possibility of her dramatic talent in some of her now lost films. Olive was a bundle of unfulfilled promise, and that's a heartbreaking part. One might linger over Olive's photographs in a high quality picture book, but this doesn't compare to seeing her in action in The Flapper where she plays the ukulele, dances, and sings across the screen. These brief moments are magical. When she looks into the camera, Olive feels like a modern woman, not just a figure from the past. The sensational aspects of her life story fade, and she comes alive right before your own eyes. All of Thomas's death negatively impacted Hollywood's already fragile reputation. Her and Jack Pickford's notorious lifestyle was latched onto by the media, firing up a series of articles about drug abuse and moral decadence among Hollywood's elite. Her death was the beginning of a chain of scandals that jolted the film industry, including the murder of director William Desmond Taylor in 1922, the drug-induced death of actor Wallace Reed in 1923, and the scandal involving comedian Fatty Arbuckle who was accused but acquitted of rape and manslaughter after the death of actress Virginia Rapp in 1921. Though Arbuckle was found innocent and Pickford was never officially implicated, their reputations took a significant hit. The American media, always on the lookout for a scandal, labeled Olive a dope fiend, a loose drug addicted woman challenging the nation's moral standards. This portrayal tarnished Hollywood's image as much as Olive's. It was a cautionary tale to those drawn to Hollywood's glittering allure. In this series of unfortunate events, the death of another star, Bobby Heron, became merely a side note. Olive's name dominated the news. Olive Thomas, a shining star, became a symbol of the hidden perils of Hollywood. Her story resonated as a warning about the fleeting nature of fame. The public's shock and dismay following these events led to changes within the film industry. To prevent such scandals, many actors began to have morality clauses in their contracts. These events also precipitated the introduction of the Motion Picture Production Code, or the Hayes Code, which governed the moral content of films from 1934 to 1968. Although Olive Thomas is not widely remembered today, her tragic end cast a looming shadow over Hollywood. And while she may have been the very first scandal, she certainly was not to be the last. <laughs>